Welcome everybody to UC 220 Religious Foundations and the Bible. My name is Drew Tucker. I am the university pastor and director for the Center for Faith and Learning here at Capital University. And I am so excited to be starting this journey with you across the semester, exploring various world religious traditions as well as the Bible as a text that has been so foundational for literary, social, and political development in the United States, not to mention the religious development of our social fabric. I have a few goals with this introductory lecture. The first is to introduce myself so we can get to know one another a little bit better. The second is to go over the syllabus pretty in detail so you can kind of understand where we're going and what our purpose is. The next is to go over some key assignments, the things that you will be required to do in order to earn credit for the class, which is kind of the big deal about this whole thing, right? We'll then go through a course introduction. We'll explore what it means about religious foundations in the Bible. We'll talk about what we mean by the Bible. We'll talk about what we mean by religion, mention some of the things that we will be exploring throughout the semester, and then introduce some of the basics of the course so you can kind of get the best orientation to what I intend to do and to what you can expect from me. And lastly, I'll have you all go around and introduce yourselves, and I'll introduce that here at the end of the class. Because even though I'm not with you live at this moment, I'm recording this uh, in the afternoon, a couple days beforehand, uh, Thomas, who is a graduate student here at Capitol, I'm so grateful for his help today, will be leading this activity so you can share your name, your year, what you're most looking forward to in the class, even if that's just simply getting your signature learning credit out of the way. And one thing about your background that will help us better understand your engagement with the material. And we'll talk more about that again at the end. But thank you again to Thomas for moderating today's class. I, because of COVID, a lot of things have gotten moved around in our lives, shockingly enough. And two meetings that I couldn't miss were scheduled right at the same time. So this one is recorded as I'm at the other one live. With that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is Drew Tucker. I'm the pastor, university pastor, director for the Center for Faith and Learning, your professor, teaching a couple of ethics courses this semester as well. And I want to be clear, first off, outside of this class, you can call me Drew or Pastor Drew, whatever you are most comfortable with. But in this class, and in context of class, I'm asking you to use either Pastor Drew or Pastor Tucker or Professor Tucker. And that's because while titles aren't necessarily my favorite thing because of my social location and where I grew up, we also, in especially in higher education, especially in our country, need to recognize that many people work very hard for the titles that they've earned, for the degrees that they've earned. And so we should opt into using them until we are invited to not use them. So this is a part of your learning process, a part of your orientation to when someone has earned a doctorate, you call them doctor whoever. When someone is your teacher, you call them professor whoever, or your pastor, you call them pastor whoever. So for me, in this state and place, you can call me Pastor Drew or Professor Tucker, whichever you are most comfortable with. I earned my Bachelor of Arts in Religion and Philosophy, two different degrees, from Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio, about 90 minutes north of here. North is not directly up, I'm aware of that, but you get what I'm doing. I earned my Master of Divinity, my first master's degree from Duke University Divinity School. And then I went on to Lenore Ryan University and their Columbia campus at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary and earned a Master of Sacred Theology, doing research at the intersection of postmodern community development and worship, particularly in preaching. And I'm currently, because I'm a glutton for punishment, pursuing a doctor of ministry from Lexington Theological Seminary, a Disciples of Christ school in Lexington, Kentucky. And the Disciples of Christ is another progressive Christian denomination that you may or may not have heard of before. I am married to my wife, Michelle. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary a few days ago. 
So she has put up with me for a decade. She deserves much more than a pandemic, that's for sure. Uh, so instead, we had cake. Uh, I, we have two dogs, Stanley and Jack. And one of my standing invitations is, if you figure out who Stanley and Jack are named after, because they're named after philosopher theologians... I will buy you a cup of coffee. No questions asked. Hopefully, you'll want me to be there and we can go to a local coffee shop and have a chat and be engaged with one another, get to know one another a little bit better. But if you just want a gift card and go to Starbucks and drink burned coffee and that's what you're looking for, that's fine. You'll get five bucks and you can go on your merry way. I am from Orville, Ohio, and I now live in Columbus, in Columbus proper, actually. I'm just outside of Bexley in what is a neighborhood called Berwick. Um, but I grew up in Orville, a small town of about 10,000 people, home of Smucker's Jelly and Bobby Knight. So I say we do sweet and sour really, really well together. Uh, I joke because Bobby, though he has a reputation and though we are certainly different in the political and philosophical sphere, he's a very generous person, not just in Orville, but across the country. And the whole Smucker's connection is just strange because my brother went to prom with one of the Smucker kids. So, you know, it's just a it's just a small, small world in Orville, Ohio. But now we're in Columbus, and I'm so excited to be a part of the Capital University community and to be your professor for this class. I want to go through the syllabus, orient you a little bit to these details, so you can be as fully aware as possible about where we're going, what we're doing, and the expectations for this course that I have. This is UC220, Religious Foundations in the Bible, and it counts for three credits here in spring 2021. Our class time, because we're a hybrid course, will be once a week on Tuesdays from 2 to 3.15 p.m. And then there will be a number of asynchronous assignments, readings, videos to watch, discussion boards to complete. And you can do those on your own time, there are deadlines for them, so they have to be done by certain times, but you can do them pretty much at any time. We will meet when we are in person in Roof Learning Center 202. Roof Learning Center 202. For these first two weeks, we'll meet on Zoom from 2 to 3.15 p.m. on Tuesdays. My office, if you're ever looking for me, is Trinity 135. So it's in the seminary complex. It's on the main floor right by the info desk. But I suggest that if you're looking for me, I don't hold office hours because I have so many other things, being the pastor, being the director for the Center for Faith and Learning, that I'm in meetings most of the day. So if you would like to schedule a meeting, I am glad to make time for that. I just need you to reach out and be proactive about that, and we will find a time to meet. You can reach me by phone, and my phone is on the syllabus. My cell is also available. You can always get a hold of me, whichever way is easiest for you. The orientation of the course is like this. From the University Bulletin, the idea is to introduce students to the general topic of religion and life and the biblical tradition in the Christian faith. The course will include treatment of parallels with other world religions. Religious foundations of the Bible will also introduce students to the historical and critical approaches of the Hebrew and Christian Bibles. That's the kind of general overview. For this particular course, what I'm going to be doing is giving you an intro to the academic study of religion and biblical literature, as well as an introduction to world religions through a number of documentaries toward the end of the semester. We're going to consider different ways that religion, including traditions, beliefs, rituals, and experiences, shapes the lives and worldviews of practitioners. Given special attention to the Jewish and Christian biblical texts, we'll spend most of our time in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. We will look at the ways in which sacred texts have been created and interpreted. Number of objectives here. We are looking to improve your familiarity with basic features of several religions, especially Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But we're also going to introduce you to a number of others as well. Give you critical understanding of cultural, historical, and textual foundations of several religious traditions. Give you the ability to distinguish between your personal worldviews and the worldviews of other individuals and groups. That's really important. It's part of the whole project of pluralism, in fact. Ability to distinguish between religious formation and the academic of study of religion. So, for instance, my work as a pastor is different than my work as a professor. 
This is about the academic study of religion, not about forming you in a particular kind of faith. And to demonstrate skills in using an academic approach to the study of religion. So I want to see you show these skills off after we've gone through them. This course should give you the ability to demonstrate a critical understanding of the nature of religion. And finally, a critical understanding of the many ways that religion can influence individual and group worldviews, politics, arts, and other things. I'm not going to read you the whole syllabus. I wanted you to have a basic understanding of what the objectives were of the course as I understand it. You can see there in the university bulletin the descriptions of the general education learning goals. Big key here, the required textbooks, three of them. One, Abraham, A Journey to the Heart of Three Faiths. That will be the book that we read later in the semester. Earlier, the backdoor introduction to the Bible, John Kaltner and Stephen McKenzie from Anselm Academic in 2012. We will start with that right away. So if you don't have a copy of that yet, you need to get it yesterday. And finally, the new Oxford Annotated Bible with Apocrypha, New Revised Standard Version, 5th edition. This is really important. We are using this particular Bible because of the particular interpretations that it offers us in the margins. So while you can use any other Bible, that's fine. We are looking at this translation and its interpretations for this course. So yes, this is required. Yes, you need this particular Bible. Speaking of requirements, there are a number of requirements for this course. You must attend, and not only attend, give thoughtful participation in our synchronous class sessions. So in other words, on Tuesdays from 2 to 3.15, you need to be on this Zoom call or in Roof 202. That has to happen. Yes, there are exceptions, there are emergencies, but you have to get permission for those ahead of time. If something happens in your life, you need to reach out and just let me know. That's fine. You can get extensions you can get excused absences but without proactive without reaching out to me that's not possible so you've got to be proactive in letting me know what's going on 10 brief writing assignment roughly two pages each there's actually 13 or 14 of those assigned so you don't have to do all 13 or 14 of them you only have to do 10 but if you'd like to earn extra credit you can do all 13 or 14 of them and apply the extra credit earned to other areas like your attendance grade or your exam grades or your other longer essay grades. Speaking of exams and essays, there will be two exams and two essays. The exams and essays are detailed later in the syllabus. We'll talk about them later, but the huge part of this is to note is that the exams will include both definitional work so more objective work as well as your own synthetic work so more subjective work seeing how you have digested and interpreted the material and your papers are an opportunity for you to dig deeper in something that we've introduced in the course attendance is worth participation discussion worth 10 percent your writing assignments is worth 30 percent the short writing assignments your two essays are worth 15 percent each for a total of 30 percent and your two exams are worth 15% each for a total of 30%. That should work out to 100%. The grading scale is there in your syllabus. You can follow through with it. You see there in the introduction our class schedule, what's going on. You can follow all the way through and see our schedule from beginning to end. It's important to see all those things so you know where we're headed and what we're doing. Toward the bottom, after our syllabus rubric you can then get to see a bit more detail on the for instance essays and short writing assignments so particularly of note there are details that you must follow in terms of the margins they need to be one inch font needs to be 11 or 12 point and they need to be double spaced these are necessary things those will affect your grade if they are not done that way that's both for the short writing assignments and for the essays your longer essays, the final handouts will be a little more in detail, but your first essay is going to be on a text or issue from the Hebrew Scriptures. So doing a bit more research, a bit more reflection on why it matters and what it's all about. Your second essay is going to be relating two different world religious traditions to your own religious or spiritual background, including atheism or agnosticism, humanism, integrating autobiographical 
autobiographical, ooh, that's a big one, reflection and topics treated in UC220. So in other words, this will be your own reflection on two different world religious traditions in conversation with your own tradition. How those will be graded is there in the syllabus. Important to see in here are a number of posts about academic success, academic integrity, diversity and inclusion, Title IX. These are all really important things. Essentially, Title IX and diversity and inclusion are huge commitments of the institutions and of mine. This should always be an inclusive and welcoming space for you. So, if you ever feel like it is not that thing, and I am not the cause of it, something else in the class is going on, let me know. If I, for some reason, the cause of it, I hope that's not true, and I'm sorry if it is, you, I want to empower you to follow these, these processes laid out in the syllabus. Because you deserve, you are paying for an education that honors you and honors who you are. And it's my intent to do that. So please use these processes if it is not that for you. In addition, if you're having trouble, academic success is there to help you. So please be contacting them. If you don't understand what's going on, ask me so I can do my best to help you. Academic integrity is something that I care a whole lot about. Essentially, academic integrity concerns are this. If you present someone else's work as your own, whether you copied their test, whether you cut and paste from a paper or a web resource and presented it as your own, that is plagiarism, that is cheating, and that will lead to an immediate failure because I will put your papers and your exams through a comparative resource through iLearn to make sure that this is all original material. And if anything looks fishy, I will Google it. And if it pops up on Google that this existed before the time you took your test and you didn't cite it, that will be a violation of academic integrity. That's not because I enjoy that process. In fact, I, I hate, I don't hate a whole lot of things, but one of the things I really hate is failing people. I've had to do it before. I'll do it again if necessary, but I don't want to do that. I want to do the kind of work that comes alongside of you and helps you do your very best. Because I believe your very best is worth it. That's why I do this work in the first place. So please, please present your work, even if you're having trouble. And if you're having trouble, reach out to me. Reach out to Academic Success. We are here to help you succeed. That's what the whole syllabus says in a nutshell. You can see, if you go back up briefly to the class schedule, that it's kind of broken into three parts. We do... A third of the class, more or less, on the Hebrew Bible. A third of the class, more or less, on the New Testament. Then a third of the class, more or less, on world religious traditions. That is the structure of the course. There will be two exams, as well as the possibility for some quizzes. Those quizzes will affect your test grades, so be sure that you know those are possible, just to be sure that you keep reading. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. That's available in the syllabus, but in case you can't see that right now, it's dtucker, D-T-U-C-K-E-R, at capital dot E-D-U. That's the syllabus, more or less. I want to go over a couple of the key assignments first, a little more in detail. I've already talked a lot about attendance. We don't need to worry about that. The reading quizzes are not going to be more than a few questions, but they are intended to make sure that you are both reading and comprehending the material or watching the videos that are there and comprehending those. So for instance, in the backdoor introduction to the Bible, I will probably most definitely put words in there that are highlighted or in quotes or italicized that are clearly defined. I'll put those words in the quizzes to make sure that you have gone through and paid attention to those very important things. I might, if there's a big concept that keeps showing up over and over again, I'll probably ask you questions about that in the quizzes or in the exam to make sure that you're attentive to those needs, to those learnings. Your writings that are going to be about 13 of them, like I said, that opportunity for you is to write and reflect on specific questions from the texts. Like I said, you only have to do 10 of them. There are 13 available. You can do all 13 of them and earn extra credit. I will give you the grades 
the highest 10 grades will count towards your writings percentage. And then any leftover credit I can apply to other assignments. So that, for instance, is one way to earn some extra credit. The long essays are a chance for you to do a little bit more research, a little bit deeper dive into some of the content that we find. And the exams, I want to be sure, again, you're paying close attention to the terms you've defined in the textbooks, the major themes we've discussed in the scriptures, key points that are brought up in the videos that we watch. The exams will be timed. This is very important. They will be timed. And because they will be taken on iLearn, and I can't control whether you use your notes, books, or the like, they're going to be more difficult than they would be if they were in the classroom. Now, that's not because I am wanting to punish anyone. It's just a measure of fairness to say, if people are going to have access to books and notes, I'm going to make sure that everyone knows they can use books and notes, and that's going to be a more difficult test so that the people who have put in the work in terms of studying, in terms of engaging the material, have the chance to show that they have given the, the deep investment into the work. That's the goal. So it's not to punish you. It's just a different kind of learning style. With all of that, let's give a brief intro to this class, Religious Foundations in the Bible. So, in other words, like I said before, this is part an introduction to the Bible as foundational literature in Western civilization and part an introduction to world religions and interfaith relationships. It's really key that you hear right now and remember that the goal of this course is not to make you a participant in or practitioner of any particular religion. My goal is not to make you believe in the Bible, not in this class anyway. The goal is to make you aware of the ways that religious and spiritual life play a role in human development. The goal is to help you see how the major themes of the Christian and Jewish scriptures have shaped life in North America. Religious foundations in the Bible are existing already, whether you pay attention to them or not, whether you notice them or not. So the goal of this course is to actually help you see things that already exist. To see how, for instance, religion is at play in both the way that our democracy was formed and the recent coup attempt on our democracy. Those are both deeply formed by religion. Different types of religion, different approaches to religion, but there is no absence of religion in either of those things. How they approach the religion is different, and that's the kind of work that makes this course so important. So you can see, so you can be aware of how people use and participate in religion in order to achieve goals, personally and collectively. So let's talk then about what the Bible is and what religion is. What is the Bible? Is it one book or many books? Well, it's bound together as one book, so it should just be one book, right? It's actually a library of books. The Bible is a library of different texts written at different times across history, across thousands of years. From Jewish and Christian traditions, from Hebrew and Greek and other ethnic traditions backgrounds. It's a book that is representative not of one, but of many views of God, of people, of society, of history. It's a collection of books about people of all genders, about people of many different religious backgrounds, about people from all over the ancient Near East and their engagement with one another and with their God or gods. Now, 
another question worth asking, since we're really looking at how this book is situated in society, how this library is situated in society, is the Bible religious or is it secular? Well, it's actually both. It's not secular per se, because that's anachronistic. The idea of being secular didn't arise in the same way for, I mean, years, years, years after the Bible was written. It's a religious text insofar as it is used in religious communities and it was given birth in religious communities, but it's not religious in that it is only religious. There's a diversity of religions and denominations represented in the Bible, and there's also a lot of other things going on in the Bible. So, for instance, did you know that the Bible represents not just religious writing, but political historiography? Not just religious writing, but poetry. Not just religious writing, but biography. Even a bit of autobiography. Not just religious writing, but a whole host of texts that are both written against the domination of empires as well as from within the dominating empire. The Bible is a collection of works that is a challenge to most of the simple definitions that we have. It's not one kind of book. It's not just a history book. It's not just a law book. It's not just a spiritual book. There's so much going on in there. And so that's why giving it this much attention, giving it a semester's worth of attention, is worth our while. Now, personally, from my perspective, I believe the Bible is an inspired work, meaning that many human authors were compelled by a divine force in their lives to record their accounts, and other human authors were compelled by a divine force to discern these as a particular set of texts worthy of religious study and community organization. That's different than simply a literary or sociopolitical definition. And that's also different than saying the Bible is inerrant or infallible. I do not believe either of those things is true. I only say that to you so you know that it's okay to bring different views of the Bible into this space. Because we're not studying it as the kind of book I believe it is for my faith. We are studying it as the kind of book that we know it is as a foundational document to the formation of positive and negative parts of our society. The Hebrew Bible, also known as the Torah or the Old Testament, and the New Testament, which along with the Torah are known as the Christian scriptures, make up the Bible. So the first two-thirds, roughly, is the Hebrew Bible, and the last third is the New Testament. There are 66 books in the Bible, as it is understood in that view. So in the Protestant Bible, in the Bible accepted by Lutherans, Episcopalians, kind of, Presbyterians, Baptists, non-denominational folks, brethren, disciples of Christ, anybody who's a Protestant in some kind of way, uses that kind of Bible. But then there are some other texts that have been a part of biblical tradition for a long time that are also part of the scriptural story. Now, the Apocrypha, as they are known, is a set of scriptures to some Christians, and they're meaningful historical texts to others. So to people like me, Protestants who have a Bible that is made of 66 books, the Apocrypha, I don't hold them as scripture in the same way, but that doesn't mean that they don't have value to my faith or to the story of my faith. So for instance, there are the Roman Catholic Apocrypha and also Greek Orthodox Apocrypha. So the Roman Catholic Apocrypha includes Tobit, Judith, some additional chapters of Esther and Daniel, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, the Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, Baruch. That collection of scriptures is the Apocrypha as read in the Catholic Church. And then the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox in particular, also use, in addition to all of those, 3rd Maccabees, 1st Esdras, the Prayer of Manasseh, 
and Psalm 151. I bring that up to say even study of the Bible is not a simple cut and dried approach. Because which Bible are we using? Whose library are we studying? And why? These are all questions that are very important that we must consider. And for our purposes, we are going to largely study the Bible as it is known in Protestant traditions. There's a couple of reasons. One, we are a school that was founded by Protestant traditions. Two, in our country, in North America... Protestants had more power and more control more frequently. So the Bible that they were using as these foundations were built was that Bible. So it's not because it's the Bible I use. It's because it's the Bible that was most often used. And then there's a whole host of other writings called Pseudepigrapha or New Testament Apocrypha. Rarely, if ever, are these considered scripture in Orthodox circles in most Christian and Jewish communities. But they're important to a small or a minority of faith communities. Now, these include everything from different kinds of what we call infancy gospels. So, gospels that kind of fill in that view of Jesus between where the gospels in the New Testament go from he was born, he was baptized, and then he was maybe 12 for like half a second, and then he was all of a sudden 30. And we're like, what? It doesn't happen that fast. So there are things called infancy gospels. One of them that has become popular in, as of late is the infancy gospel of Thomas. And then there are other gospels that challenge some of the theological approaches that we find in the New Testament. So those are like... The Gospel of Judas, for instance, the Gospel of Thomas. These books that we know existed were not included in the New Testament canon for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason is there is no evidence of them being early texts. And by early, I mean before 100 AD. All of the Gospels, all of the New Testament writings have a tie to an apostle, to a disciple. And there is an argument to be made that is widely accepted, at least by some, that it was written or it was starting to be written before 100 AD or 100 CE. That's a really important thing to know. Even the Gospel of John, which we think is probably the latest of the Gospels and one of the latest books, is likely written around 90 CE. Book of Revelation, likely written just after 100 CE. These books, while later, are still connected to the apostles who followed Jesus. Maybe written very late in their lives, or maybe written by their disciples, by the next generation, as a legacy to carry on the teachings of their teacher who had died. That is a very brief introduction to the Bible, to the scriptures that we're going to be studying, and why we're not going to be engaging as much some of those other scriptures that you might be interested in. That doesn't make those other ones in unimportant. They're very valuable. They're fascinating books. I love them. I've got half a dozen collections because they're just so intriguing. But they're not the Bible that was used to develop the foundational principles of North America, particularly of the United States. And they aren't the books most often in common conversation in other world religious traditions, which is why we focus then on this set of texts. So let's position ourselves then. Let's take a turn to religion. What is religion? How would you define religion? This is a good question, I think, obviously in this class, but really for us to consider because there's lots of things that are religious that we may not consider religion you might even think about how you have friends or family that say, oh, I just do this thing religiously. Well, what does that mean? Why are they saying that? What's, what's the callback? Well, here is how we are going to define religion in this class. A religion is a community of people who utilize religious, I'm sorry, ritual practices 
in the worship of objects, pursuing ultimate meaning around a set of beliefs. A community of people who utilize ritual practices in the worship of objects, pursuing ultimate meaning with a particular set of beliefs. Keep that in mind for your upcoming quizzes and exams. Those five things. So, in my particular tradition, in Lutheranism, we have a number of rituals like prayer, like weekly communion, uh, even things outside of the worship space, like, for instance, potlucks. Lutherans love potlucks. This is not a uniquely Lutheran thing by any means. Lots of people love potlucks. But our potlucks feature some very strange dishes from... Uh, from the German and Danish and Swedish origins of our church. And so you'll find things like sauerbraten, which is this like roast beef soaked in vinegar. It's like, you like it. I like it, but it's weird. Then there's lutefisk, which is basically like gelatinous canned fish. Not a fan. Just, just not a fan. Right. But it's part of the ritual to, to eat these things like once a year for some people. So we're a community of people whose ritual practices help us to worship objects. And in particular, our worship is directed at the God who we find revealed in Jesus. In the pursuit of ultimate meaning, who are we, why do we exist, what is the meaning of life kind of questions, around a particular set of beliefs. And that set of beliefs includes, for instance, the Apostles' Creed, which we won't talk about extensively in this class, but is a common Christian statement of faith that defines who the God is that we believe in and some of the key aspects of that faith community. As well as, for Lutherans, what's called the Book of Concord. Think about that word, concord. It's drawn from the idea of concordance. We are in concordance with this set of beliefs. And the Book of Concord is not scripture. It is, rather, the way that we interpret scripture and understand ourselves as church in relationship to that scripture. So that's what our community and ritual practices and worship and pursuit of ultimate meaning and set of beliefs looks like. Yours will look very different, I imagine. That's good. It's not just okay. That's a great thing. Because what I want to hear about in your introductions here in just a little bit is the things that might affect your understanding of religion. So when I say, not just introduce your name and your year, what you want to, uh, why you signed up for the course or what you're most looking forward to, even if it's just getting credit. But that last idea, that thing that's going to help us understand you in this course, what's your community like? What rituals do you participate in? How do you understand worship? What does life mean to you? What do you believe? That kind of stuff is going to help us better understand one another. With this course, though, with the idea of world religions, the other thing that I want to be very clear about is that this is a course that embraces an approach to world religions or interfaith work that is called pluralism. Now, pluralism does not mean that you cannot hold specific beliefs. That's not it at all. Instead, pluralism embraces the diversity of beliefs and considers it holy and valid that people can hold on to their various religious traditions. So I'm not going to ask you to learn about Jane Dharma because I want you to become Jane. And I'm not going to teach you about the New Testament because I want you to become Christian. And I'm not going to introduce you to the Quran because I want you to learn to become a Muslim. Instead, I want you to learn about these things because they are beautiful. And because you have friends and family and peers for whom these things mean the world. And so becoming more conversant, more aware of these things, validating them as things that exist and things that are good for our communities is a way of being faithful to one another. In fact, I have learned more about myself and my religion in conversation with other people in their approaches to religion. That's the kind of thing that is super important for this course. So in other words, there's no proselytizing here. If you're in this course because you think you're going to be able to get a convert to your particular religion, that's that's not the case here. I will not be trying to force anyone to join a particular religion. 
So please be aware of that. This should be a space for all of us from all of our different religious traditions to learn something, to develop and to grow. So here's a few basics of this course, things that I think would be helpful for you to be aware of at this point, to be learning now and then to become more aware of as we do some more teaching in the weeks to come. The first thing that I want you to know is you will know where I stand, but you do not need to agree with me to get an A. That is so important. You will be graded on your ability to clearly state your point of view and argue its rationale. Say it differently. You will not be graded on your belief set. You won't fail just because you write that Jesus didn't exist. Nor will you necessarily get a good grade for saying Jesus is Lord. Neither of those is sufficient. You must justify your points with reason and textual references as well as confront possible objections to the points that you bring. This course does expect gender-neutral language in reference to humanity and divinity when appropriate. So what that means is, if you're talking about a person that you know is a woman, you can use female pronouns. That makes sense. Use the pronouns that people have asked us to use. That is appropriate. He, him, they, them, she, her, zizir, whichever ones our colleagues want us to use, we will use. But if you don't know someone's pronouns, don't just unnecessarily gender them. Further, when you're speaking about humanity in general, don't talk about mankind or man. It's humankind and humanity. And further, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and this is super important to know, and no, I'm not making this up. This has been agreed upon for like thousands of years. God does not have a gender the way that we have a gender. God's gender identity is a mystery. And so while Jesus calls God Father, for instance, in the Bible, that does not mean that God's gender identity is absolutely known. Because guess what? There's also scriptures that we will read in the very first weeks that present God as a woman in labor. What we have in the Bible is a host of metaphors for God that give us a diversity across the spectrum of gender. So for God, you can have a couple of different options. You can talk about God with multiple different pronouns. So you can use he and she and they for God. You can choose a gender neutral or gender fluid pronoun set for God. That's fine. You can use God as a pronoun for God. So God said to God's self, that's entirely appropriate. Be sure that you're tending to this. That's an important part. Again, we're doing the academic study of religion. So be aware that that matters. All of the readings and the course videos for the day must be done before any other assignments. So class attendance, discussion boards, writing assignments, quizzes or tests, that should all come after you've completed the writing assignment, or I'm sorry, the reading and video assignments for the day. So if you look at our iLearn layout, for instance, you will see that on a particular day, we have a few different sets of expectations. So on next week, on Tuesday, I expect you to have read Genesis 4 through 12, the Enuma Elish, available at that link. And then complete the discussion board, the initial post, before we show up in class. That's what I'm looking for you to do. Then on Thursday... I expect you to read Genesis 12 through 22 in the backdoor introductions, chapters 3 and 4, Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh in the Bible, before you post your discussion board. Do the reading and the video watching beforehand. That's a really important part of the process because our reading and our videos are going to guide our class engagement. Most weeks have discussion posts 
that require something of us on Tuesday and Thursday. So be really attentive to that. That means that I expect you to post original content Tuesday and Thursday, as well as respond to three of classmates for each of those posts. So two original posts and then three classmates for each of those posts means a total of eight posts per week in the discussion board. Looking for that level of engagement in the discussion boards. So be aware of that. Note also that in addition to the textbook, there are hyperlinked articles and videos both in the syllabus and in iLearn. And if there is something in either of those places, you'll be responsible for it. I believe that everything that's in the syllabus is in iLearn. Just in case, though, I want to say very clearly, you're responsible for the, the, the learnings, the readings, the videos that are listed in either place. So if there's a test question that comes from the syllabus and you didn't see it because it was I, wasn't on iLearn, I'm sorry, but it was in the syllabus and it's still a valid question to be asked. Just want to say that up front. Be aware of that together here as we go. Please note the timing of our final exam. While it will not be in person, it will only be open during that period. Again, as I talked about exams before, it's going to be more difficult than it would be in a class period, but it will also be open book and open note. Also, because of that, I don't want you doing them together and to ensure that that won't happen, that people won't benefit from other people's taking the test in advance, it will all be done at the same time. Please plan for that now. Remember that for your work schedules. Remember that for all that stuff. Keep that in mind for that last week of classes. <laughs> and then, lastly, our papers, the different writing assignments. Most of them, most of them are due on Tuesdays. The written assignments. Not quite all of them, but most of them. And they will all be referencing back to material that was previously due. So, for instance, in week two, your first writing assignment is due already, yes. Reviewing chapters one and two of the backdoor introduction to the Bible and relating it to the biblical text that we've read in class thus far. So for that writing assignment, you should be able to review chapters 1 and 2 of that book and relate it to Genesis 1 through 12. Not every part of Genesis 1 through 12, but you can draw on any of that content. Oh, here's where I see something that the authors wrote reflected in Genesis 5. Great. Thank you for sharing. That's the kind of work I'm looking for in those written assignments. Making the connections, doing the synthetic work. Here's what this book said. Here's what I read in the Bible. Here's how they relate to one another. Again, synthetic, tying together, developing. That's what I want to see in those written assignments. One suggestion as you do them, if I were you, I would finish the week's readings, discussions, and classwork. And then... Write the paper. Finish everything before you start writing the paper. It will help you have a fuller perspective to offer as you write it. Because even though you don't have to, it might be easier to write about the book after you've watched a video that might be linked for the week. Or even though the book might not relate specifically to the Epic of Gilgamesh, although it definitely will, reading the Epic of Gilgamesh might give you something to talk about that helps you fully see what the authors are saying. You can do it in whatever order you want. I just think that will help you write it and it'll be easier for you at the end of the day. <laughs> Lastly, as we come to the end of this part of class, and as Thomas gets ready, if he hasn't already, to hit record, I want to give you thanks to be grateful to you for this opportunity to be your professor as well as a pastor here on campus with you. Because I'm so grateful we can be working with one another, engaging with one another in this way. I'm really passionate, really passionate about creating spaces where we can all learn and grow, where we can all develop and change. And so this is a space where you should be able to ask difficult questions, ask big questions, where you should be able to dream big dreams. Even if it's not okay to do so in your religious tradition that you grew up in. 
or even if it's pushing at the boundaries that you were told God doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't mean that. The goal of this course is not to dismantle your faith, whatever that faith is. The goal of this course is to give you the space to see how world religions in the Bible are foundational for the way that people build their lives. And so you can begin to ask, how have certain texts, how has my own religious tradition been foundational in the way that I've built my life, even if I haven't noticed before? That's success for me. If you're doing that at the end of the semester, that's how I know I will have done my job and done it well. So grateful for you. So lastly, introduce one another. Give me your full name, what year you are, what you're most looking forward to in the class. Again, even if it's just getting your signature learning credit out of the way, that's fine. Not going to hurt my feelings. And then tell us something about yourself that's going to help us understand you as we engage in discussion boards and as we engage in class. And again, relate it back to that idea of religion. A group of people who gather around rituals, worship specific objects, have a specific set of beliefs, and pursue ultimate meaning. What are the things that we should know about in your life that relates to any of those themes? That would be, I think, a most helpful way to introduce yourself. I will be live with you next week. I will certainly be emailing you this week with a couple of other thoughts and be engaging with you on iLearn and the discussion boards. I'm so grateful again to be a part of this with you. I am hopeful that we will have a wonderful semester. And if you need anything at all, call, text, email, telegraph, tweet, Facebook message, WhatsApp, whatever whatever works for you, group me. Although I feel like all of my life gets lost in group me at this point, but that's okay. If that's your preference, that's cool. Just reach out. Don't do this alone. We're here to do this together. And I'm so, so, so glad that I get to be a part of this journey with you. Blessings to you. Peace to you. And I look forward to being engaged in conversation with you over the semester. Peace.